It's mid-afternoon, November the 9th, 1939. Four men park their car at the Café Bacchus in the Dutch town of Venlo on the German border. They look completely unassuming, but looks can be deceiving. Two of the men are MI6 spies, Captain Sigismund Payne Best and Major Richard Stevens. They keep their Browning high power pistols close. German border guards stand just meters away. This is a risky mission, but a tantalizing an opportunity. It all began in September with a German refugee named Fischer. Claiming to have contacts in the German resistance, he's introduced Best and Stevens to figures in the Wehrmacht who want to overthrow Hitler and make peace. Today, they have been promised a meeting with a German general. Are MI6 about to end the war in Europe? Hello darlings, this is Spies and Ties, a series of World War II in real time, and I am Astrid Deinhardt. Modern British intelligence operations have their origin in the Secret Service Bureau. The Bureau was created back in 1909 by the Admiralty and the War Office to keep track on Kaiser Bill's Navy and to guard against German spies. Gradually, the Navy assumed responsibility for foreign espionage and the Army for international counter-espionage and the Bureau splits into two sections, foreign and home. The home section that becomes a little something called MI5. The foreign section, that's our MI6. Their proper name, though, is the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, or just the service. The service first director was the adrenaline junkie Captain Mansfield George Smith Cumming. When he's not racing his cars or motorboats, he led the service through the Great War. He signs all his letters with a big C for coming in green ink, a tradition upheld by all his successors with C meaning chief. After the Great War, the service spent most of the 20s trying to overthrow the Bolshevik government in Russia. You can see how well that turned out, right? Anyway. Cumming dies in 1923 and is replaced by Rear Admiral Hugh Sinclair. And by the late 30s, uh, Sinclair is convinced that the real threat is from Germany. This sets him apart from some people in Britain like, oh, huh, who is it? Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and the Foreign Office. Sinclair does his best to get the service ready for war and in July 1938 he spends 7,500 pounds of his own money, which was a lot in that time, on a manor house in Buckinghamshire. The name of the house is Batchley Park and a little known group of crypt analysts called the Government Code and Cyber School GC and CS are the first tenants. Later that year, in December 1938, he channels his inner Nostradamus. So what does that mean? He sends the Foreign Office a memorandum on Germany. He writes that Hitler now has unbounded self-confidence, which has grown in proportion to the strengths of the machine he has created. So, when September 9, uh, 39 rolls around, who better to be in charge, right? Well, poor old Sinclair dies of cancer on November the 4th. His last letter written to a friend reads simply, first bulletin, nearly dead. 
Fortunately, the day before his death, Sinclair named his successor. His deputy, 49-year-old Colonel Stuart Graham Menges, is the new capital C. This is all going on while MI6 men in the Netherlands are trying to stop the war. Best and Stevens pull up to the cafe. They see Major Shamo. He's their contact in the Wehrmacht resistance, one of the men that Fischer has introduced them to. Shamo raises his hat in greeting as he recognizes their car. So far, so good. But before the Brits even know what's going on, they're being rushed by armed men firing wildly into the air. Their Dutch escort, Neutland Dirk Klopp, steps out of the car and returns fire with his pistol. He's fatally wounded immediately. Bast and Stevens are handcuffed and bundled into a waiting car. They're driven off across the border. What happened? Well, you're all clever boys and girls, my darling, so I can assume you've already figured it out, right? It turns out that MI6 have been had. The whole thing was a ploy by the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, the intelligent agency of the SS. Schemmel. He's nothing other than Walter Schellenberg, one of the SD top counterintelligence men. And Fischer, he's been working for Schellenberg the whole time. To make matters worse, Best and Stevens are carrying a list of agents with names and addresses. Under interrogation, they will spill the beans about everything they know of MI6 continental operations. You know how that goes. It's a pretty miserable start to the war of MI6. Minges has been in office for a matter of days and is already fighting off allegations that this service isn't fit for purpose. The accusations resurface next spring. The British are blindsided by the German invasions of Denmark and Norway on April 9th, 1940. Why weren't we warned? asked the armed service chiefs. To be fair, it's not entirely Menges' fault. He had provided good information on Scandinavia to the military, but it either got lost in the bureaucracy or hasn't been properly assessed. That happened a lot. Further disaster comes when the Germans invade France and the Low Countries on May 10th, 1940. MI6 representatives scrambled home in the face of the German panzers. They carry with them what resources they can. The Haag station brings a load of industrial diamonds. Calais brings platinum. Most of the exiled Polish general staff are evacuated from France. Still, it's a disaster. Shockingly, MI6 had made no plans whatsoever for stay-behind networks to report from France in the event of occupation. So, SIS are now effectively blind. More and more pressure is heaped on Menji. In a March 1941, there's a meeting of the Secret Service Committee which brings together all of Britain's various agencies. There's MI6 and MI5, of course, but also MI3, which focuses on global geographical information. MI10, which analyzes weapons, and MI11, who deal with military security. This whole meeting is only really called because MI6 aren't doing very well. The government is worried about a German invasion. They want details on forces, invasion plans, activities, all ports. But Menges can't help. He's working with Air Ministry to get agents and wireless sets into Europe. He's got a network up and running in Belgium, and he's desperately trying to rebuild his network in France. But this will take time. He has got something up his sleeve, though. 
Well, he'd struggle to fit an entire Victoria Manor house up his sleeve, right? But it's Batchley Park and the government code and cyber school. GC and CS, remember them? They are his ace. They're working hard to crack the German Enigma communication code. I could put you to sleep here and explain exactly how an Enigma machine and his rotors and its 159 quintillion setting works, but that is not my expertise, my dears. That's not really my style. I'll leave that up to Indy because he's got a whole video on the machine and on those who crack it. The main thing is that by spring 1941, Bletchley is providing a steady stream of information on U-boat positions and their intended targets, which help push the Battle of the Atlantic in Britain's favor. Thank God. They also get good information on troop movements in Yugoslavia and Greece and plans for the German invasion of Crete scheduled for May. Churchill orders this sent to Archie Wavell and Bernard Freiberg, right? But alas, intelligence can only do so much. Crete is lost anyway when the German attack on the 20th. Enigma also gives warning on the invasion of the Soviet Union. Warnings that Britain passes on to Stalin to no avail. Stalin may not be benefiting from Ultra, but Menges is. He personally supplies Churchill with the Ultra intelligence deposited in a sealed box on the Prime Minister's bed each morning. Churchill can't get enough of it and thinks that Menges is a wonderful fellow. Menges, Ultra and MI6 are the stars of the show. But there's more to war than signals, right? While Bletchley's bombs are wearing away, MI6 are rebuilding their network on the continent. This brings them into conflict with the Special Operations Executive SOE. You remember them from my video where I changed outfits six times? Their job is sabotage to set Europe ablaze. SOE only exists because previous MI6 chief Hugh Sinclair had given the order to their formation in 38. So, MI6 look down their nose a bit at this upstart organization and are worried that it's getting too big for its boots. They keep stepping on each other's toes. Both are running agents in occupied Europe. Both are making demands on the Air Ministry to get these agents in and out, and both are flooding the continent with wireless kits to keep in touch with them. Menges complains that SOE's acts of sabotage are hampering his work. Every big explosion, every train attacked by partisans, those provoke a furious security response from the Axis, which gets in the way of MI6 more subtle intelligence gathering, right? Personalities and pride also play a part, of course. In late 41, SOE proposed that the two organizations be represented in West Africa under a single SOE chief. Manger's chief of staff, Rex Howard, is having none of it. MI6, he writes, is an established organization, whereas SOE is a mushroom growth. Back in the field, away from the Whitehall politics, SIS is having some success, but it comes at a cost. In France, they work with the French resistance and with the intelligence agency of Charles de Gaulle's government in exile, the Sparty. Very good. One of the largest rings that MI6 works with is called Alliance. It runs by Marie-Madeleine Forcade. In August 42, it counts 145 names in 10 different cells across the country and will rise to 2,000 by spring of 43. Alliance are made up of a cross-section of French society. One of the cell leaders is codenamed Panthère. Among his 30 agents, he has an engineer with serious sources in the Bouvet region, 
a Paris-based cultured woman with contacts in media circles and a port employee in Brest who possesses information on movements of all German boats. We've seen before how women can be pretty good in pilfering military secrets. One such agent is Jani Rousseau. A 20-year-old fluent in German, she works for the Wehrmacht as a translator. She ends up spending time drinking and partying with the German officers. At the parties, they talk freely about their work. In spring 43, she inquires about two strange words she overhears. Over and over again, Peenemünde and Raketen. Thinking nothing of an innocent question from an attractive young woman, an officer shows her drawings of a rocket and gives her details on a testing station in Peenemünde on the German Baltic coast. Jani doesn't know it, but she's just been let into the secret of the Wunderwaffe, the V1 and V2. She recreates the drawing from memory and passes them on to Foucault. Soon Jani's drawings end up on the desk of none other than Winston Churchill himself. Alliance play a constant, deadly game of cat and mouse with the Gestapo. Pierre Verrier, codenamed Seagull, runs rings around the Gestapo in 42 and early 43. He says they are remarkably stupid. When out in the countryside, he poses as a wandering beggar, allowing him to roam unmolested across farms and fields, searching for covert landing spots for agents coming in from Britain. But Allianz soon gets a deadly reminder that not all Gestapo men are so easily evaded. In January and February 43, the Gestapo swooped down on the network in Marseille, Lyon and Nice. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, personally tortures two young women, hummingbird and mouse. More arrests follow across the country throughout the year and Foucault is forced to return to Britain. MI6 have come on leaps and bounds since the Venlo incident back in November 39. It's reading a vast quantity of German Enigma messages with real impact on the wall. It's rebuilding networks across Europe and beyond, picking the pockets of the Germans for whispers and secrets. But there's always a human cost. Best and Stevens spend their war languishing in Sachsenhausen and Dachau. Now, Hummingbird and Maus, who risked everything for a cause they believed in, are the latest casualties in MI6 secret war. If you like to learn more about the resistance, who were so crucial to the service work, you can click here for our gallery special on resistant leaders and to get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at TimeGhostTV or Patreon.com. Thank you for this, and I will see you next time, darlings. Mm -hmm.